In his ethnography, The Land of Open Graves, anthropologist Jason DeLeon reveals the horrific realities of undocumented immigration from Mexico to the United States through the use of first-hand accounts, photographs, and a bevy of different research strategies. He presents the overwhelming scope of this humanitarian crisis through the lens of the Sonoran Desert, a vast stretch of arid, inhospitable landscape that has become a major migration corridor for undocumented immigrants trying to reach the United States and, consequentially, one of the focal points of the United States Border Patrol's prevention through deterrence approach to immigration enforcement. Initially implemented in 1994, this strategy entails closing off historically frequented urban points of entry in order to force migrants into what the federal government deems hostile terrain, essentially. In the words of De Leon and Eduardo Lalo Garcia, outsourcing border enforcement to nature. In the epilogue of The Land of Open Graves, De Leon makes it abundantly clear that his ethnography was never about solving the problem of illegal immigration. But why would De Leon refuse to posit a solution to illegal immigration, the issue that many would identify as the core of the humanitarian crisis that The Land of Open Graves is representing? To understand that, one must first understand the parochial, underdeveloped arguments that, through sheer repetition, the Democratic and Republican parties have saturated discussions of, quote, solving the problem of legal immigration, unquote, in popular culture for the last several decades. The Republican Party's approach is more xenophobic and harsh as compared to the Democratic Party's approach. The Republican Party aims towards stopping illegal immigration by building a wall along the border of the United States and Mexico, having a stronger border security, and deporting all illegal immigrants into the United States. Democrats, however, show greater importance on the path to becoming legal by making it easier to help families to immigrate to the U.S. and letting those who immigrate here illegally as young children stay here. Nancy Pelosi, a speaker of the House of Representatives, stated that the Democrats have twice passed the Dream and Promise Act to finally offer dreamers a permanent pathway to citizenship while fixing our broken immigration system through comprehensive reform. In reality, however, both the Democratic and Republican parties want to keep and preserve the status quo. That way, Border Patrol can continue their jobs, have an easy pull of cheap labor for detention centers to profit off of. This is most apparent in the annual federal spending bills, most of which pass with bipartisan support, that allocate billions upon billions of dollars to federal immigration enforcement. According to a 2013 report by the Migration Policy Institute, the United States spends more on federal immigration enforcement than all other principal federal criminal law enforcement combined. The 2022 Consolidated Appropriations Act, the bill which provided the budget for the federal government this year, allocated $173.77 billion to the Department of Homeland Security, $35.57 billion of which has, over the course of this year, been spent on immigration enforcement and border protection. After a few revisions, it had no trouble passing the Senate with bipartisan support and was subsequently signed into law by President Biden on March 15th of this year. The Biden administration's clear dedication to preserving the status quo does not end there. They have also maintained Title 42, an unprecedented Trump-era policy that allows authorities to quickly eject migrants encountered at the U.S. southern border from the country over COVID-19-related concerns. Those asylum seekers who are not immediately turned away under the policy are detained in one of the many privately owned detention centers that the Department of Homeland Security funds. Although a federal judge recently ordered the Biden administration to end Title 42 enforcement, so much damage has already been done. The human rights first stated in an article titled, I am a prisoner here. Biden administration policies lock up asylum seekers. That while this administration is not currently detaining families and has requested a reduction in detention funding, its policy has led the Department of Homeland Security to target adult asylum seekers as priorities for detention. This detention of asylum seekers actually violates United States legal obligations that are under the Refugee Convention and its protocol. It states that asylum seekers should not be detained. The use of detention is, in many instances, contrary to the norms and principles of international law. Even though Biden pledged to get rid of this detention, the DHS under the Biden administration has still detained thousands of asylum seekers. The Democratic Party frequently cites that Republican resistance as the main reason why they are never able to advance the immigration policy. Republicans are vice versa, saying that the Democratic Party gets in the way of their immigration policies. Even though this political gridlock may look like failure from the House of the Senate slash Representatives, it is keeping the status quo preserved at all costs.
This utter stagnation of progress towards actual immigration policy reform is what has come to define popular discourse surrounding, quote, solving the problem of illegal immigration, unquote, in the United States of America. In what one can only assume is an attempt to prevent the land of open graves from being mired in that same cyclical performative discourse, De Leon simply avoids it altogether. He instead asserts his primary goal as, in his words, quote, to make visible the effects of U.S. border enforcement practices designed to be hidden and draw more attention to the violent logic on which the entire immigration security paradigm is based, unquote. Only when Americans have acknowledged these things and the socioeconomic forces that drive them can we as a nation even begin to approach instituting the systemic reform necessary to deconstruct the sprawling network of human rights abuse that is the U.S. immigration system. This is precisely why ethnographic works like The Land of Open Graves are so valuable. Alongside providing the breadth of information necessary for the public to address crises like the one occurring at the U.S.-Mexico border, the intimate photographs and highly detailed first-hand accounts they feature allow readers to directly connect with the individuals and communities involved. Without this ethnography, no one would have an, any knowledge of these human stories. For example, the introduction of De Leon's key informants, Memo and Lucho, is simultaneously heartwarming and heart-wrenching. In part 2, page 94, De Leon writes, My first impression was that they were lifelong friends who were trying to cross the border together. They had such an easy rapport with one another, I was shocked to learn that they had met only a few weeks before I showed up at the shelter. They were amigos del camino, whose friendship blossomed one night as they sat in federal detention and were sent to Nogales the following day. These men quickly bonded over their need to survive deportation to an unfamiliar border town and their shared desire to cross back into the United States. This excerpt is just really touching and sweet for a moment. The reader is charmed by the bond of friendship between these men, but then there's like the subtle reminder of what it's based on and how the reason their friendship was able to blossom so quickly is because each other was all they had. And aside from obvious uses and influence the ethnography has on the general American public, it's a well-written guide on how to ethically go about creating an ethnography. De Leon didn't want to use the common method of participant participant observation as he didn't want to do anything illegal or encourage illegal activity or use his privilege as an American to interfere with the natural process of things. It has amazing potential to influence anthropologists or up-and-coming anthropologists to take risks in an appropriate way. This ethnography could also be extended and related to other migrant crises around the world where citizens need to flee their home country for a better life. This could include, but obviously isn't limited to, immigrants from North Korea fleeing to China and immigrants from Rwanda who fled to Burundi and Uganda or even the Congo um, at the time of the Rwandan genocide. The concept introduced into the ethnography very early on, prevention through deterrence, could be applied to the Syrian migrants during their attempts to flee Syria due to the Syrian civil war. The ocean for Syrians could be compared to the Sonoran Desert in that that was the only hope to escape Syria by the sea. With all of these given potential uses in society, it's clear to see this ethnography is perfect for its time and is indeed very useful.